us a little bit about how you got started in stand up. Yeah. What drew you in in the first place, and and what made you stay? Uh, it was a very big accident, and I always give different answers to this question because there's like a bunch of different stuff that happened, and it's quite a long story. But um, I was uh, so I was in a band. I was very bored all the time. I worked twelve hours a week in a kitchen. And that was it. And like we had band practices, but I spent a lot of my time with nothing to do. So I um, I tried to just start doing more things with my time and stuff like that. Um, I think I'd. So I think after I I've, I've written off three cards in my lifetime, and I think after writing off the first one, I started trying to do things. I think I had a bit of a almost midlife crisis when I was at seventeen or eighteen, <laughs> or however old I was. So. Uh, I was trying to just do things that I hadn't done before. I did a skydive and then I went to the volunteer centre to try and do volunteer work so I could feel like I was a good person. And uh, they sent me to paint an old lady's kitchen and I did quite a bad job. It looked pretty awful and afterwards they, were, they said, oh, you know, thanks for doing that. Is there anything that we can do for you that, that you would like sorting out and then we can kind of like help you out? And I felt so bad about the bad job I'd done at the kitchen that I just said I'd like to try out stand-up comedy because it, I did genuinely, I was curious about it, but man, I mainly said stand-up because I was like, they can't sort that out because they're <laughs> a volunteer bureau in Kettering, they can't actually sort out stand-up and they said they couldn't sort that out and that wasn't you know, the kind of programmes that they did. And then four days later, I think they rang me up saying a guy come in and he wants to start a stand-up comedy workshop and did I want to attend it? So I kind of had to say yes because I told them I wanted to do stand-up. And then I turned up and there was me and two other students and one guy who was teaching us who was um, originally, I think he was an open spot and never got past being an open spot and quit and hadn't done comedy for a long time. Uh, but he turned up, he turned up with beers and just drinking uh, to himself. He didn't share them. He would kind of be a little bit more pissed each week. And he would just say, right, you get up and do five minutes of comedy. So he didn't really give us any advice. Just a chance. But it, he would just say, you get up and do that. So you'd have to go away and write like, five or ten minutes every week and come back and then you'd have to perform it to three people in a little room. And then at the end we did a gig. I was still in the band at the time and what I really wanted to do was the band so I wasn't doing this for a serious thing and I did that gig and it, it was really fun. The whole audience were really, really encouraging us because we were open spots doing our first ever gigs. And so because I enjoyed it, every now and again, like every four months, I'd, do a, I'd book myself in a stand-up comedy gig and go and do it just to give myself that. I just like the adrenaline of it and also because I didn't care about it. Yeah. I would more often than not do well because I didn't. Ca I, I, I was making a lot of it up on the spot and going up on stage and not caring. I think I had two real nightmare gigs during like I did about twelve gigs over three years or something like that right. uh, of two years and uh, had two really humiliating awful ones and the rest of them were kind of fine. And then when the band stopped, I just was like, I just decided I'd do stand up in the meantime. I didn't want to do it as a job. I wanted to do it, you know. While I came, while I figured out what One I really wanted, wanted to do, yeah. and uh, what was great about it was that I could just do gigs all the time. So, he said, like, what kept me in it is like with 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 the band. It would take ages to book a gig and get gigs, and we would get one a week if we were lucky because there wasn't you know, so many bands and so few gigs. And with comedy, there's so few comedians and loads of gigs, and also the gigs would have like 15 acts on when you're an open spot. So I just discovered that I could film my diary and be gigging all the time. And even though I wasn't sure I really liked it, I didn't like the feeling of not knowing what I was doing. I used to know what I was doing when I was playing the drums in a band, but I didn't know what I was doing with this. And even though a lot of it, I was like, I don't want to do this for a job, definitely not. But I really enjoyed being able to go out, do gigs all the time, uh, write new material all the time and say it on the night if I wanted to. Um, I didn't have to rely on anyone else. I didn't have to like, you know, write a drum beat and hope the guitarist has come up with a new guitar if that day I could just do that. So all of it was quite like, and, and also I could go and do a bad gig and come home and it wouldn't be that thing of when you're in a band, you're in the car on the way home, or being like, like you, you booked the gig and everyone else is pissed off, it was awful. <laughs> Whereas when you're stand up, you're just like, yeah, that was shit. And then you go home on your own and you're not whinging at yourself, you know. And so I kind of thought, this is, I like doing that. And I like the fact I can just do it all the time. And then about, after about a year and a half, I decided actually I'd like to do this as a job, but it took me a year and a half to go. To actually I enjoy decide it. this is what I want to commit to. And yeah, I think I'd, 
I'd got enough of an idea of how to do stand-up by that point that I was enjoying it. Did it change your approach to it when it suddenly became, okay, this is going to be my job now? Yeah. Did it affect the way that you then approached gigs or writing material or...? Well, yeah, because um, actually the first gig, when I, so the first gig after the band had stopped, so I said, I said that you know, the gigs had gone quite well before that when I didn't care. As soon as I cared, I died horrifically every, every single time. So like, yeah, as soon as I cared about it and was actually writing material and not improvising, um, I was just going and, you know, I'd walk on stage and try, try hard and fail and get nothing. So as soon as I cared about it, it was going worse. So do you think, we were talking about the, the fact that you changed slightly when you cared about you know, becoming yeah. your, your job. Do you think that the audiences could kind of read maybe more tension about it or, or a, a less relaxed demeanour on stage? What do you think? Well, yeah, I'm definitely less relaxed, so that would have definitely fed into it. It, it was because I suddenly wanted... If I, I think I thought, if this is what I'm doing now, even if it's, I'm only doing it for a while, I want it to be as good as possible, whereas before I didn't care if it was good or not. So I was just going on and saying whatever and... You know, anything for an easy laugh and stuff like that. Whereas when I started trying to get the other sorts of laughs that I thought had more value to them, it was really difficult. So I think, yeah, I was struggling more, and I was like, oh, I'm now trying to be better than I am. You know, yeah. so like it, it was, it was quite difficult. And they can probably tell when you're not comfortable, or, or they can kind of just tell when something doesn't suit you. You know, and you're you're not really, you know doing the kind of material that suits your persona and they can they can tell that audiences I think. Um, if you find that comic voice, mm. do you does that then help your writing and does it change the way that you write? Yeah, yeah. But then so originally it did. Originally I was like, right, I'm gonna write for that voice now and really really think about that. And uh probably did that for a few years and then you end up kind of painting yourself into a corner a little bit because like, oh, everything I do is now this if I'm not careful. So I think you have to constantly be looking for uh, other aspects of that persona and try and make it more three-dimensional all the time and keep on adding to it. So, you know, try and go, okay, where's it, what would this persona do in this situation? If I, if I move, you know, if I start talking about uh, politics on stage, then what what would this persona, how would that, this persona react to that? Yeah. And can I talk about that kind of stuff and still maintain this persona? So like, yeah, I think you start writing for that, but then you've also got to challenge it and stretch it as well, as much as you can. So when you are kind of writing for your, when I did this comedy school course, they talked yeah. a lot about being aware of your persona and how other yeah. people view you on stage yeah. and, and kind of, as a, not not playing to it necessarily, but being aware of it in the material that you create. Yes. Now your material is, I would say, you know, very heavily observational mm -hmm. in terms of picking up on things that everybody recognises in their everyday life, but maybe thinking about it in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you're writing, then are you looking for the thing that people have? Are you looking for the thing that everybody recognises and then trying mm. to find what's funny about that? Or are you looking for the thing that they haven't quite spotted before? Um, neither, really. I'm just kind of like trying to write what I think is funny. Right. So that's all I've ever done. And, and then you just try and... But certain things jump out at you, but you don't really know why at the beginning. You just know that, oh, I'd like to write about that subject. So a lot of the time I'm just looking for subjects that just make me feel like I want to talk about them. And then I'll start doing them and then writing about them and you kind of find, so you naturally start thinking of observations or uh, stories you could tell about them or jokes, uh, you know, proper jokes or, you know, so whatever, whatever it is uh, and what you, what you want to say about it. Sometimes it might be something that's, you know, a subject that has annoyed you recently in the news or in life and you want to talk about that so you know that your frustration has to be a part of that as well and you're going down that path. So, yeah, but with observational stuff, I never, I think, the more I try and do that kind of stuff, the more I fail at it. And you've got to let it work, let it happen itself and just go, oh, okay, so this is an observational bit, fine. And then yeah. do that. And you kind of find that uh, a lot of the time you think that you're, you're doing it in a pretty straightforward way sometimes and then other people say afterwards, oh, yeah, you've done a different spin on it. And, whatever. and you don't really realise. It's just how your brain works. So, like, you know, for all comics, I think you just think in a certain way and then you discover later on if you're 
mainstream or alternative or a bit of both or whatever it is people tell you, but you don't really know. So it's for other people to classify you rather than you to try yeah. and say, this is what I'm... It's not how you come across to people until people tell you. In, you know, in my life before I did stand-up, no one was coming up to me and telling me if I was an outsider or if I was a cool guy or whatever. I was just me, and I, I f probably thought to myself I was pretty cool. And then I started doing stand-up and everyone's like, you're not cool at all. And you go, oh, okay, cool. Like, that's, that's who I am and this is how I come across to people and you get a bit of a better impression of it. And then you just write loads and I think there's always a point in a stand-up's kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, journey or growing up where, where you suddenly realise what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. But you're never deliberately doing it and you kind of go, oh, it's this. And you, and you you notice things like a pattern and go, oh, that m m that routine and that routine, they both work much better than anything else and it's because of these things. And, you know, because I'm talking about this, I'm doing stuff like this. Um, but it takes you ages and trial and error. And, you know, my first routine that worked well was a routine about bearing a grudge against the ticket desk man at Kettering train station. And uh, now I know that the routine worked because it was a long form routine and I worked better over long form routines. It was me focusing on a tiny detail and obsessing over it and that works for me. It was an observation about how we all bear grudges that, that we shouldn't do against people. But I didn't know any of that at the time. I thought that it went well because I was talking about a negative aspect of my personality to begin with. So I tried to write loads of routines that were all showing me in a bad light because I thought that's what I should be talking about. I was talking about all works, yeah. the worst parts of me and I didn't know why it worked. So yeah, I, I had yeah, about six months of just doing routines about you know just all the awful things that I did and them not working and me going, okay, that wasn't why that routine worked and then having to go back and figure it out again. Go through it. Who, who would you say, kind of as you've gone through your journey, has been influential, um, either other comedians on the circuit or yeah. people that you've watched or... There's loads of people, it's, it's quite uh, hard to pick out big ones, but before I started stand-up I was watching a lot of Dave Chappelle and I think that probably his delivery, if you watch certain uh, shows that he does, uh, I think you can see a bit of that in, in me still, I think, kind of. Yeah. Uh, and I've got to pick up some of his mannerisms a little bit. Um, there's other comics, that, Mike Wozniak uh, on the way up really inspired me because he'd been going for a year longer than me and I remember going to Edinburgh for the first time, I'd been going for six months and he was there doing his debut show and everyone, you know, secretly behind his back, if you're watching this mic, we, we, we was saying, I don't think that's a good idea, like, you know, he's, doing, he's going in way too early. He had no one taking him there, he was doing it by himself right. in a venue that, well, wasn't a venue, it's not really a venue now, you know, it was a venue no one really, it was in the centre next to Bristol Square but like, no one really considered it a proper venue. He started just doing his own flying and no one was helping him and everyone was thinking, oh, that's not a good idea. And then he got nominated for the Newcomer Award and then suddenly was like headlining gigs all across London. And I remember seeing him do a gig and realising how well written all of his materials. It was just amazingly well written and he had a very clear defined persona. And just thinking, oh, like, it doesn't have to take years. You can literally, if you just get your head down and work hard, you can do it whenever you like. And just realising if I just get better at writing and get better at performing, like Mike has, and just really work hard at that, then you know that'll be that's probably a better route to go rather than what I was doing before, which is kind of like going, well, you know, at some point I'll just be good and just kind of yeah. going around just just trying everything, um, but thinking like, yeah, at some point I'll I'll just be a good comedian and not going, oh, well, actually, I've got to become focused like him and stuff. So he was a massive influence early on. What advice have you been given by comedians that's really helped you out? Uh, when I was starting out, I went to see Josie Long and stayed behind to talk to her afterwards, and she didn't know who I was. Uh, we're obviously friends now, but like back then, she never met me. And uh, she told me uh, that when you're in an open spot, try out every single idea that you've got, um, no matter what. Uh, while no one can judge you uh, and I think it's a very good bit of advice because I think when you're in open spot uh, I think you only really you're saying about you know, being told about your persona and stuff like yeah. that like I think that's all well and good but I think you have to in order to find out what your persona is you have to try everything because yeah. um, otherwise what you're doing is you're going by what you're again what you're uh, you know, image of yourself is in your head and going, that's who I am. And actually, it might not be. So just do 
every single idea you've got and try and do some really experimental ones and try and do some you know, not so experimental. You know, just try everything to really find who you are and what, what you're capable of. Okay. I think it's a good idea. Um, and what have you found out for yourself that you wish somebody had told you previously? That failure is a massive part of it and is okay and that it's inevitable and you're, you're only going to get better if you fail. No one told me that. I, I, I always felt like I had to be good and uh, that every gig had to be good and every routine had to be great and no one told me that, you know, when you're in a band, for example, you can just practice at home and then go out and do the song when it's ready and with comedy you can't do that. You have to practice in front of the audience and fail in front of them and make all your mistakes in front of them and that a bad gig is as useful as a good gig if not more useful. So just to kind of... As long as you're learning from it, as long as you're not one of those people who goes out and dies all the time and just goes, oh, I love it, I love dying, and then go home, and then everyone's like, oh, what a cool guy, and then you just... But really, the whole thing is just do not try. But like, if you're going out, trying everything and accepting the failures as good things because you're going to learn from them, I think it's, it's a good way to go. And Too many open spots get made to feel like, or let themselves feel like they should be the finished article already. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, especially with the amount of open, you know, new act competitions that are out there, which instantly make you feel inferior to everyone else if you're not doing well in them. And I just think you've got to, you know, most of the people who won those new act competitions when I was an open spot aren't even doing stand-up anymore. And the ones who went out in the first round are all professional comedians. So, like, it's all about failing and learning. Learning and keeping going, keep coming up. As long as you're open to learning still, then you're fine and you, and you can get it at some point where the penny can drop but like even then you, ne you never fully in order to kind of understand that and get that attitude is that you have to kind of appreciate the fact that you'll never fully understand it anyway so right. so you, you know and just never be one of those people who goes yep got it sus now I know how to do stand up now and you know to a degree you do but like you know in terms of you, you're never going to be as good as you could be you always know what your potential is and you've always got kind of a vague image in your head of something that could be just better than what you're doing now. And you're trying to crack that and get to there. And then once you do get to there, your potential is outrun you again and you can get to that next bit. So I think, yeah, it took me six months to get a routine that I even liked and then like another year after that to decide I actually wanted to do it as a job. And, you know, so it's just... It's an ongoing kind of... Yeah, and even then after that probably took me another year or so to find a, a voice that I liked, you know, a comic voice that I liked, a persona, you know, so yeah. And you touched briefly on kind of your first experience of Edinburgh. Mm. Tell us a little bit about what, what Edinburgh's like, because this whole documentary is focusing on this yeah. journey to Edinburgh. Sure. What's it like for a comedian being up there? What was your first experience like? Well, my first experience is a bit more extreme than a lot of people's, but I, I decided to go at the very last minute. I didn't know what Edinburgh was. I didn't know that it was important um, and someone... Uh, at my work, I used to work in the kitchen, gave me a, a ticket to go on the Megabus or the, no, the National Express coach to Edinburgh, which yeah. took 12 hours. And uh, I went and I, because it was last minute, I couldn't book accommodation, so I camped in a field. And it rained for two weeks and my tent got flooded and uh, I didn't have any gigs booked in and I went around just asking for gigs. And I managed to do six gigs a day for two weeks. And it was the most valuable uh, two weeks I probably ever had in comedy. Um, there was a day when I turned up at a gig at noon in Leaf, which is a bit of a way out, and no one had turned up to it. It's just me and the other two comics, and one of them had the So You Think You're Funny semi-final that afternoon, uh, uh, which I'd gone out, out in the first round in, and he is now not doing comedy. That's not, that's not <laughs> gloating, but that is, that, that, that is just, that is just what happens in stand-up. Um, but... Um, that probably is gloating, actually, isn't it? But uh, uh, anyway, he, um, he wanted to try out that five minutes, even though there wasn't an audience there, and he wanted us to also try out, the, uh, you know, just do five minutes so he didn't feel stupid. And I didn't want to do it, so I thought it feel stupid doing it for two comics. I got up and did a routine that I'd never dared do before because I thought that it was too specific to me and no one else would relate to it. I did it, and they really liked it, and they said, told me I should do it all the time, and I did it every day in Edinburgh at every single gig. It became my first bit that worked. It was that train station routine yeah. and it became the first bit that worked and it was that gig was yeah just invaluable so um, I think Edinburgh is great for just doing stuff all the time when you're in an open spot just do all the gigs you can and don't focus on what anyone else is doing and just focus on you getting better and then try 
and then take that attitude for the rest of your career because I think it's the only way to, to do it, really. Brilliant. Yeah. Jed, we'll, we'll let you get on and get ready for your gig. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, mate. Nice to meet you. Good luck as well. Thanks.